same thing, uh, which I, I hope I've never done that. But uh, uh, one of the descriptions I've seen from that is somebody who's more than 10 miles away from their hometown. I think I'm, I think this qualifies because I'm, I'm a good uh, good distance further than 10 miles from East Liverpool. Um, I've had a lifelong interest in history, especially uh, Civil War history, and over the years that's kind of uh, settled down into a lifelong interest in local Civil War history. So that uh, in addition to the stories of the individual soldiers and uh, uh, you know, collect their letters or photographs, anything I can find, one of the greatest day of my life is, uh, well, since my wife isn't here, I can, <laughs> I can be truthful about it. <laughs> this, when I received a, uh, a diary that was mailed to me from somebody in Washington State, uh, a diary from a local soldier from East Liverpool, and, and the diary just absolutely um, blew the doors off of several long-held uh, Civil War stories uh, as far as what the guy actually wrote down in his own diary had happened. So anyway, um, when you are involved in history in Columbia County, uh, there are a couple things that you have to do or pretend to do. Um, you have to be prepared to talk to somebody about Pretty Boy Floyd. Um, you have to be prepared to nod with a smile on your face when people tell you unlikely stories about how their grandfather had, you know, a three-hour dinner meeting with him uh, right before he was killed. And, and you know, the, in, in the back of my mind, the word liar, liar, liar. <laughs> uh, but I can't say that, I found out. Uh, so I try not to. So you, you have to be prepared to talk about Pretty Boy Floyd, which I'm not going to do. In fact, I told John I, I put Pretty Boy to rest for some time. That was much over overused. But the other story that, that I have um, always had people coming back to and asking about, maybe not quite the, the number of uh, made-up lies because it took place much earlier. Um, in fact, one time I was doing the Pretty Boy Floyd story and some sweet um, lady called me from Mahoning County and said, well, I can't come to your talk but she said, I just wanted you to know that my father played baseball with this man um, back in 1934. And she said, it was Pretty Boy Floyd, and, and he, he did come to our house for dinner that night. I thought, okay, great. So um, I don't think Morgan came to anybody's house that's here today. Um, if he did, that might make a good story. but. Uh, it, it is a good story, regardless of, of the yes. level of people's interest. Yes. Um, Morgan, of course, was a Confederate uh, cavalry officer. Uh, he was born in uh, Huntsville, Alabama in 1825. When he was still a child, uh, he and the family moved to Lexington, Kentucky, and he was uh, enrolled in, at the right time at uh, Transylvania College. <laughs> Um, and he, he had trouble with his college education. In fact, he was expelled uh, from Transylvania College for what I consider a really novel reason. Uh, he wouldn't quit dueling with people. <laughs> and that was against the rules. So they, they threw him out of college for dueling and other misbehavior. Uh, John Hunt Morgan had six brothers and two sisters. All of whom grew, grew to adulthood. Uh, John and his brother Calvin and an uncle joined uh, a Kentucky unit during the Mexican War and went to Mexico and were engaged in, in fighting at the Battle of Buena Vista, uh, where Alex, the uncle, was killed by Mexican Lancers. That sounds like a very painful way to go. Um, but uh, John and, and his brother both returned to. Uh, Kentucky. Um, they were involved in various business enterprises, uh, but always with this tremendous interest, at least in John's case, of military training. 
and so they were, uh, he was a member of the militia organizations that were very prevalent through the South because uh, <clears throat> a lot of the Southerners felt that they would be called upon sooner or later to defend their homes and their, their way of life. And they weren't wrong. Um, and uh, John helped organize the what were called the Lexington Rifles, which was an infantry unit. And then he later organized a cavalry unit in the Lexington area. <clears throat> One of the reasons that John had time to do this, uh, I guess he wasn't going to too many reunions at Transylvania College uh, since they threw him out, but uh, he was well to do, certainly. And uh, he, was, he was a married man, but his wife, uh, his first wife, was pretty much an invalid. And uh, so he was not able to uh, uh, be heavily involved with uh, going places with her, and she, she was at home and, and in declining health. Um, in fact, she uh, finally passed on in July of 1861. <clears throat> By that time, Morgan had organized the 2nd Kentucky Cavalry for the Confederate service. Um, and uh, he had to sneak some of the men and their equipment, which was their equipment before the war started, <clears throat> out of uh, Lexington, uh, their arms and, and all that stuff, so that the Union sympathizing residents of the area wouldn't take it. Um, as was frequently the case with uh, organizing of Civil War units, since John had organized the, the unit, he became colonel and then voted. Um, and he was colonel of the second as of April 1862. He was 36 years old when the war began. Uh, during the first year of the war, uh, interestingly, all six of the Morgan brothers served in the Confederacy. Um, his two sisters, uh, different times back then, they didn't, uh, they didn't serve in uniform, but they, they, both of them married Confederate Brigadier Generals. So it was a, a very... Uh, Confederate-oriented or family. One of the sisters married a uh, fellow named Basil Duke, who was one of Morgan's uh, right-hand men. The other one married uh, General A.P. Hill, who was famous for a variety of things in the Eastern Theater, including uh, coming up to the Battle of Antietam just at the absolute crucial time to prevent Lee's army from being rolled up. Uh, and of course, A.P. Hill was killed, I think, seven days before Appomattox. So that was um, a, a very heavily involved family. Uh, during that first year of the war, Morgan's command uh, conducted raids on railroads, uh, supply lines <coughs> of the Union forces, <coughs> basically running guerrilla warfare type operations. Um, in fact, on one of the occasions, I'd kind of love to know how they did this, but he managed to burn down a tunnel. <coughs> the tunnel was wood-lined, and they managed to get a hot enough fire going to burn the wood lining, collapsing the tunnel. So that was a, considered a great success uh, at that particular time. One of the other things, these, these guys were really, you know, if you read anything about them, a lot of characters. Um, there was a, a fellow uh, attached to the command uh, called Lightning Ellsworth. And, and Lightning wasn't his name, but he was a telegrapher. So that, that becomes your nickname pretty much by definition. And <clears throat> throughout his service, uh, Lightning Ellsworth would tap into Union telegraph lines and was able to send messages uh, he certainly did this on the Ohio raid. Send messages to the poor, unsuspecting Union telegraphers that, uh, you know, newsflash, Morgan is approaching with 50,000 men, or so-and-so uh, uh, has been totally defeated by Morgan. Just anything to mislead and confuse the enemy. And uh, <clears throat> Lightning was certainly with him on the Ohio raid. Now, uh, one of the 
Morgan was considered never the, the peak of the Confederate cavalry officers. We had Jeb Stewart, Nathan Bedford Forrest, and others. <clears throat> Um, Morgan lost a lot of his reputation early on because um, after the death of his first wife, he frankly was quite a catch. And uh, in December of 1862, uh, he married a woman named Martha Reedy, who was from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. <clears throat> And at that wedding, there were 30 Confederate generals in attendance. Um, Jefferson Davis was there. The marriage was performed by General Leonidas Polk, who previously had been the Episcopal Bishop of Louisiana. Um, oh, and the other thing about that, um, Morgan was then 37, and Martha was just barely 19. And uh, <laughs> they say that after he was married to Martha, after many years of, of having a, a, an invalid wife, that his keenness for the operations, uh, the Confederate military operations, seemed to lessen somewhat. <laughs> but he stayed, stayed with, the, with the cavalry. And then uh, in the spring of 1863, uh, and that's what brings us to the story and brings Morgan to Columbia County, uh, the Confederacy was, was doing better than expected, but still the, the, decks, the deck was definitely stacked against them. <clears throat> in the Eastern Theater, Robert E. Lee was getting ready to invade the North again. Uh, and the invasion would end up with the Battle of Gettysburg. In the Western Theater, which is basically Tennessee and Kentucky, uh, Confederate General Bragg was, was biding his time, partly because there were not one but two Union armies getting ready to advance on his position. Uh, one would be Burnside, who was in Cincinnati, and the other, General Rosecrans, um, who was already in the field with the Army of the Cumberland. Uh, the Confederate goal and the orders that were given to John Hunt Morgan were to take his command, and by that time his command consisted of <clears throat> two full brigades of Confederate cavalry. So probably about 25, 2600 effective uh, soldiers in that, in that uh, division. And his orders were to disrupt Union supply lines, because they, they knew that the Union armies were, were going to be moving on the, the uh, central Tennessee area, uh, to delay the Union advance and basically just be a, a pain uh, where he could be a pain. Bragg gave him very specific uh, instructions so that he could pretty much do what he wanted he could raid, he could uh, you know, cut ties with, with his immediate uh, command, but that in no circumstances should he do anything that required him to cross the Ohio River. Um, now, now interestingly, General, um, General Morgan, he had received a commission as a Brigadier General uh, <coughs> in the fall of, of 1862, <clears throat> although I think it's really interesting that he, he got the commission, he had been t signing documents as Brigadier General Morgan for months. So not a guy that waits for the chain of command to catch up. So the, uh, the actual Ohio raid began in Tennessee on July 2nd, 1863, the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, for anybody keeping track. <coughs> Um, he left uh, Sparta, Tennessee with his brigade, brigades, I should say, and crossed the Cumberland River um, and entered Kentucky with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 men uh, and four pieces of artillery. On July 4th, 1863, there was a ba small battle at a place called Tebbs Bend on the Green River. 
Um, there was another fight the next day uh, at Lebanon, Kentucky, and in that battle, one of Morgan's brothers was killed in action. Um, by this time, they had gotten to the Ohio River, still in Kentucky, of course, but, but on the, the south bank of the Ohio River. And uh, they waited along the river with their artillery set up until uh, an unsuspecting riverboat came within sight. They allowed it to get very close and then opened fire, forcing this steamboat to pull into the southern shore, where it was immediately uh, confiscated and became kind of a de facto uh, part of Morgan's Navy. Um, they did the same thing with a second uh, steamboat, which was one that was very familiar in the East Liverpool area uh, prior to that. They used these two steamboats to ferry the entire command over to the Indiana side. So already he's, he's going against his orders. Um, they got into uh, Indiana. Uh, they burned the two steamboats that they had uh, captured. Uh, they got into Indiana and immediately his telegrapher just had a field day, tapping into every line he could find, sending uh, reports to Indianapolis that Morgan was on his way to, to, to take the capital, um, which he had no intention of doing, but, but basically uh, stirring up the Union uh, forces and the politicians. Uh, there was a, a small battle in a place called Corridon, Indiana, which was somewhat inconclusive, but uh, got a lot of attention in Indiana. Uh, by July 13th, 11 days into this campaign, <clears throat> Morgan entered Ohio at a place called Harrison, which is north of Cincinnati. <clears throat> at the time, Cincinnati was this huge military uh, camp. And it would have never been possible for Morgan to go through Cincinnati with his command. Uh, so they, they basically skirted the northern side of Cincinnati, uh, the Union camps and Camp Denison and some others that were in that area. In fact, one poor, poor guy from East Liverpool who was a captain in an Ohio regiment received a letter from his mother a couple weeks later saying that if, if you folks in Cincinnati had only captured uh, Morgan down there, you would have saved all of us in, in uh, Columbia County a tremendous fear because uh, kind of suggesting that they weren't doing what they should be doing down in Cincinnati. But Morgan scouted, uh, skirted around uh, Cincinnati. It took him 36 hours to do that, which was a, a big dent um, in the time that was available to him. Um, and it, it's during that time that some of the articles appeared and they were played up much later about the pillaging and plundering that Morgan's men were doing. They, uh, stories about them going into shops and taking women's dresses and bolts of cloth and anything they could get their hands on, not really because they wanted it, but just because they were young and they were having a good time. Um, they eventually, on the 16th of July, crossed the Scioto River at Piketon, Ohio, <coughs> and camp near Pomeroy the next day. Now, by this time, they're getting close to the eastern border of Ohio and uh, the Ohio River. And uh, as they approached an area where Buffington Island is located, uh, by that time, he had roughly 2,000 men left. They, you know, any kind of Civil War cavalry operation would uh, result in people dribbling away and casualties here and there and people maybe thinking, I don't really want to do this and that sort of thing. But he still had most, the overwhelming majority of his command. Um, they were engaged in a, a major fight, uh, one of the problems that Morgan had, and I don't think he ever realized it uh, when he started out on the raid, is that even though he had this terrific telegrapher that could stir up the Yankees with false information, when Morgan captured a town, it was known everywhere in the North within minutes. 
and uh, the uh, command structure was such that they could send troops, they could send ships, they could send trains with troops on them anywhere that they might be needed. And that's, that's pretty much what was done for the next few days. Uh, there was a, a substantial fight at Buffington Island. Um, there was uh, a number of, of Confederate troops captured there, including uh, Morgan's brother-in-law, Basil Duke. Uh, he and about uh, <clears throat> 700 of his men were captured near Buffington Island. Uh, the rest escaped with Morgan. They went north on the Ohio River, still on the Ohio side. They wanted to get over into Virginia because it really wasn't West Virginia until later that year. It was still part of Virginia. Um, the, uh, they did come to a place called Reedville where they were able to, to splash across the river. Morgan was one of the ones who did actually make it across to, to safety. And before the rest of his command could, could ford the Ohio, a gunboat showed up, a Union gunboat, and it opened fire. And, uh, those who could uh, kept going on the Virginia side, but Morgan dashed back across <coughs> the river to Ohio so that he could be with his command. Uh, they think that probably about 300 men got across the, the river at, at uh, Reedville and uh, although they weren't captured, they were useless to Morgan from that point on. So <clears throat> once he got back to the Ohio side and rounded up the rest of his scattered command, he had roughly 900 men left. Now, if you want to escape and go south, it does seem counterintuitive to head north into the lion's den, and yet that was the only option that he had. Uh, they were being pursued. There were trains uh, sent along the river. A lot of the uh, places that he passed through were just inland enough that they weren't directly on railroad lines, not directly available to ships on the river, but it, it was not looking good. Um, and finally, uh, well, not finally, but uh, at one point, they made it all the way to Jefferson County uh, near Wintersville, and there was a bit of a skirmish there. And again, that's several miles inland from the river. Um, there was a woman wounded there, or one of the local militiamen was killed, um, but he, again, got away and, and headed generally north, northeast from that point. By July 25th of 1863, Morgan and, and his command reached <clears throat> what was then um, called Nebo. Some of you may know it as the, the uh, major, uh, I, I say this because a friend of mine lives there, but uh, I tease him mercilessly, but uh, it is now called Bergholz. <laughs> And uh, okay. they would Nebo then, and they, uh, the Confederates uh, camped for the night uh, in, in Nebo. Um, Morgan supposedly had dinner with a local Copperhead family, uh, people who were sympathetic to the Southern cause. And uh, what he didn't know is that even while they were trying to sleep uh, that particular night, there was a train coming up the Ohio side, uh, right along the river to um, another, another town that had a more colorful name in 1863. Uh, this particular uh, train stopped at a place that was then called Shanghai Station. <laughs> it is now Empire, Ohio, if any of you get down there. <clears throat> and they dropped off um, a fairly large group of Union cavalry that had come all the way from the Cincinnati area by rail, which doesn't sound like it would be terribly comfortable, but it's got to be riding the horse all the way across to Ohio. So these, these men were, and their horses were relatively fresh. <clears throat> and there were other Union cavalry that had been following Morgan from the very beginning. Uh, at some point, uh, this new, 
command met up with the ones who had been pursuing uh, for days and days, and uh, the, the fellow who was in command of the rail uh, born uh, reinforcements said, well, look, I'll, I'll be part of your command, but when, I, when we get a chance, I want to be able to try to dash ahead of Morgan's men and bring them to a stop, because obviously his, his horses were much better shaped than the ones that had been on the road for two weeks. <clears throat> so the next morning, on the 26th of July, uh, Morgan uh, got his command mounted and headed uh, north again. They got almost to Selineville. In fact, they got to the hills directly above Selineville, where they were able to look into the, the, uh, the area where the railroad passed through. Uh, Selineville, and they could tell with their binoculars that Selineville was absolutely full of Union troops who had come, who had come by rail. Um, so they knew the road was blocked. They, they turned around and dashed to the west down a, a long, uh, steep gully. And it, in fact, these things were so close that while they were doing that, some of the troops that had followed them from their overnight bivouac in uh, Bergholz opened fire on them with artillery. Um, and it presents a, a picture. I, would, I wish I had some talent, a paintbrush or something. But they set up artillery in a cemetery uh, along the road here. It's still there today. And fired uh, down at Morgan's command as they dashed to the west. So it was, uh, from that, that point on, really, the last, uh, the, the last day of the raid was pretty much chaos uh, from beginning to end. Um, Morgan moved around to the west of Selineville, <coughs> heading north, and eventually heading east again. Uh, they... came through uh, part of Carroll County and uh, they were approaching a little cemetery that some of you may have seen. It's called West Grove Cemetery, technically in Carroll County, but also very close to uh, <clears throat> Jefferson and uh, Columbiana County. Um, they went through Summitville, they went through Millport, and eventually they worked their way around to Route 518, which basically runs east and west. Morgan's command headed east on 518. <clears throat> In the meantime, this, this relatively fresh Union cavalry had separated from the more jaded uh, ones who had been pursuing them from the, the beginning. And they, they basically were looking for their opportunity to, to become heroes that day. Um, unbeknownst to Morgan at that time is that the good people of Lisbon, then New Lisbon, had, uh, had been called out um, because of the, the news that Morgan was coming. And they uh, organized kind of an emergency militia. They sent uh, one mounted group out early that day, the 26th, from Lisbon. And they were so efficient that they, they went south and just kept going south and uh, managed to walk themselves right out of a campaign. Uh, but then there were two units of uh, militia infantry that were organized in Lisbon. And they, uh, they were a little slower having to walk the distance. So they walked about, uh, I would say it's probably about seven to eight miles from downtown New Lisbon to Route 518. And they were on a hillside above uh, the area where they expected Morgan to appear. And as militia tends to do, they got bored. They couldn't decide who was really in charge, um, since nobody really had any authentic military rank. Um, if any of you have seen the, the old uh, 1960s movie, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, I think it was probably a lot like that, where people are, are, are 
fighting with one another over grudges that they've held for decades. But uh, <clears throat> they were they were in a good position. They had an artillery piece uh, aimed towards the direction that Morgan's men were, were expected to come. Uh, they built a roadblock, and uh, then they started thinking. Uh, and the next thing you knew, they sent uh, three of their own members out on horseback to scout to see what they could, could find out. Well, the, the one fellow went up by himself, and he went uh, fast enough, or far enough to the west that he saw the uh, Confederate cavalry. <clears throat> he whipped the horse around and gave the horse the spurs. Um, and headed back to where the militia was was masked on the hillside. And when he got back to the militia, he, he uh, supposed to have said, "Run for your lives! They're coming." <laughs> and that was that was the end of, of quite a bit of the Lisbon militia. Uh, the other two guys that had been sent out <clears throat> uh, didn't. Uh, <coughs> didn't do that exactly. In fact, the, uh, the fellow who dashed back and rode the horse all the way back into Lisbon before he stopped. Um, and uh, the explanation that I've seen offered a couple times is that it was a borrowed horse. <laughs> so I guess you, you treat a borrowed horse somewhat differently than you would your own. But the other two uh, men went and, and actually encountered Morgan and were basically captured by him. And uh, Morgan was looking for local intelligence sources, so he said, oh, you, you, you guys come with me. And uh, <clears throat> when they got up to the intersection where the, uh, the rest of the Lisbon militia had set up uh, their, their encounter, um, there were very few there. And Morgan indicated that he really didn't have any interest in New Lisbon. He would, he would even sign something to the effect that he would leave Columbiana County as soon as possible. Um, and he was really wanting someone to give him terms to surrender, and I, nobody really picked up on it. But he took these two other men, these two Lisbon civilians, with him. And uh, eventually, as, as was uh, expected to be the case, the cavalry that had started out in Empire, Ohio, uh, came along, saw what was going on along Route 518, um, and they dashed down the creek bank and got about a, a half mile ahead of Morgan's command. They went up to the, the road and set up a skirmish line. Um, and within a short matter, matter of time, uh, Morgan's lead element saw that they were going to be in for a fight. So they uh, again, the, the messengers went back and forth. Um, Morgan demanded that uh, Colonel Rue surrender, uh, which was a bluff that he had used many, many times, but that didn't work. Uh, Rue demanded that uh, Morgan surrender, at which point Morgan came up with this interesting approach, a man that could think on his feet. He said, uh, I can't surrender to you, I've already surrendered to Mr. Burbick here. <laughs> Burbick was a Lisbon civilian and apparently kind of a colorful one, um, and at one point Morgan said, I want to, I want to surrender my command to you on condition that we escort ourselves out of Columbia County with our horses, with our firearms, <laughs> with our swords. <clears throat> and poor Burbank, he didn't, he didn't know what to do. He said, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so then there's this hilarious scene, which I, I wish there had been video camera capabilities, but uh, when, when Rue and his officers were told that uh, Morgan didn't want to surrender to, to them because they had already made terms with Burbick. Um, eventually, they, they said, no, we're not doing this. You either fight or, or surrender. And after some grumbling, um, 
the remaining 336 men who were with Morgan uh, went into captivity right along Route 518, where the, where the marker is now, um, which is not many left out of the 2,500 that started out. So there was no fight there, um, at least not at the, the point of the surrender. Um, nobody was killed there. Um, there had been some casualties earlier in the day uh, at the um, when they went around uh, Salineville, but like everything that would involved with Morgan's raid, there's controversy um, as to who who did what to whom and when. But the net result was that the 336 men who were captured uh, were led back to Salineville. Uh, and then the officers, I, I think all of them, were then taken to Wellsville, Ohio, by train. Uh, the officers were put up for the night in the Whitaker House Hotel, which was supposed to be the, the best that Wellsville had to offer at that time. And uh, uh, the men were, were kept probably just in a field somewhere down there. But uh, uh, there was fairly interesting story that, that some sympathizers in Wellsville had a plan to sneak Morgan out of the Whitaker house and roll him across the river to West Virginia so that he could escape, but that uh, didn't come to anything. And eventually uh, Morgan and his men were taken to Columbus. Uh, the officers were put in the Ohio State Penitentiary. You know, anybody that, that does much with military thing, you might say, really? Um, you know, the understanding was that prisoners of war would be dealt with as prisoners of war, not as criminals. And although they didn't treat the enlisted men that way, Morgan and his officers were, were shaved, had their, their beards and heads shaved, and were put in with the uh, convict population. Oh. Now, Maybe they'd have been better, to, better off to treat him well because within a matter of a month, Morgan and uh, I think four of his leading officers made their way, made their escape from the Ohio Penitentiary. And there's, there's considerable dispute about whether they dug a tunnel or whether they bribed a guard or whatever. But they got out of the, the penitentiary. They went to the nearest tra railroad line bought a ticket <laughs> and went south. Um, got, got as far as uh, Cincinnati and then somebody rode him across the river. Um, not all of the officers escaped, but Morgan and, and some of the, don't know what happened to poor Lightning Ellsworth. Uh, I'll bet they left him in prison. But, uh, so, that was basically the end of Morgan's raid. Um, and, and what did it accomplish? Militarily, not much. Um, the, they accomplished the theft of 2,261 horses just in the state of Ohio. Um, they had to call out 50,000 Ohio militiamen to, uh, to help complete his capture. Um, damage to buildings and structures and animals and, and uh, cattle and whatever else uh, by rebel troops came to the total of $495,000. Uh, damage by Union forces uh, came to $152,000. These were all done in the, in the form of claims. And it cost a quarter of a million dollars to pay the militia for their time. So it was not with, with, uh, without any effect. I think uh, it's interesting, that it is to me anyway, that in Columbiana County, that was the only county in Ohio that sustained more damage from U.S. troops than from the, the Raiders. <laughs> by, uh, about three to one. Um, Morgan had re escaped, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I said a month, but it was actually November 27th of 1863. 
Uh, he returned to Kentucky. I, I think he probably didn't, wasn't greeted with open arms by General Bragg because he had lost two brigades of, of cavalry. And um, at that point in time, those weren't easily replaced. He had also lost two brigades of better quality troops than were available to take their place. So Morgan uh, tried to reorganize uh, a new command. Uh, there was a lot of scandal. As he did so, uh, there were even uh, allegations that, that his men were simply robbing banks um, in their spare time, pillaging uh, amongst the Kentuckians and Tennesseans. Uh, Morgan had not improved his security consciousness, uh, which was always deficient. In uh, September 4th of 1864, he had marched his new brigade into Greenville, Tennessee, <coughs> and uh, immediately <coughs> took up uh, uh, room in a, one of the finer houses in, in Greenville. Um, and whoever was put in charge of uh, security and uh, pickets and all that sort of thing kind of fell down on the job. So that uh, the next morning, Union troops rode into town and uh, one of them uh, caught Morgan trying to sneak through somebody's kitchen garden and called on him to surrender. And when Morgan tried to run, he shot him dead. Um, after that, uh, eventually Basil Duke was exchanged and uh, he took command for the remainder of the war. Um, some of the, uh, the more pontificating authors have said that, that uh, Morgan left the name second only to those of Forrest and Stewart among the cavalry of the Confederacy and a character which, amid much to be condemned, was not without traces of a noble nature. And that, that appeared in, in a two volume uh, set called Ohio in the War that came out in 1868. Um, and, and like a lot of these historic tales and uh, like taking reference back to the pretty boy Floyd uh, scenario, people talked about this for the rest of their lives. And uh, there were a, a, a lot of uh, stories. The, the newspapers would, would drag this out regularly. And uh, one, of the, one of the least favorite things that I've had to do with this is read these newspaper accounts that came out either during the war or 20 years later or even longer after the war and try to determine who's making this stuff up out of the whole cloth. Because <laughs> clearly some of it was, was imaginary. And uh, even uh, the, the fellow who had, uh, Morgan had tried to surrender to, uh, Burbick, uh, he was given a hard time in New Lisbon. Uh, the Republican paper in Lisbon uh, made the comment uh, that he was going around town and, and uh, trying to, to puff up his importance because of his, his moment of fame in the raid. And, and they concluded their several paragraphs by saying, oh, James, what a jewel thou art. Um, and uh, uh, James Burbick lived, uh, oh, another, until 1898. Um, one, of, uh, one of the businessmen in East Liverpool uh, told me once that, that he's a direct descendant of, uh, of James Burbick. I said, I, hope, I, don't, I don't think you want to advertise that uh, too much to people that really know the story. Um, there have been a number of, probably the, the first of the local treatments of this, other than just newspaper articles, was this. Um, there was a fellow named Sims, who was a, uh, an editor of the, one of the papers in East Liverpool, and his wife was also not a bad writer herself. So they put, put themselves to the task of dealing with 
uh, the the last day and last night of Morgan's raid. And there's some actually pretty good stuff in there. Um, somebody else had, uh, the Whitaker house eventually burned or was demolished, but that's, that's how that looked. Um, back as, as this, I don't know if any of you remember, I do, but uh, in 1963, there was huge excitement, you know, for the centennial of the Civil War. So that we had uh, a reenactment uh, near the site. Uh, they had artillery firing, they had cavalry charging, they had infantry going back and forth, which there were, there were no shots fired in 1863, but that didn't stop them from uh, putting together a, a, a huge mock battle. In fact, uh, I finally tracked down the name of the poor devil. Uh, they had a, a fellow that, he, back then, the uh, safety concerns and, and practices left something to be desired. Um, and, and the story was that this, this one young fellow, only 18 years old, said, I'd like to be in the artillery. It's you're in the artillery. And uh, he was uh, not, not being very well supervised and went to ram home a, a powder charge in a cannon that had not been sufficiently cooled and the, the powder charge went off and he lost his arm um, as a result of that. So, and that is why for probably 35 years you could not talk to any politician in Columbiana County about doing any kind of living history there because they all had had a really bad taste in their mouth, or they all got sued for it, but uh, um, they, uh, eventually times changed, but uh, um, and we managed to commemorate the 150th anniversary of, of the raid without any deaths or dismemberments, at least that I can remember. Um, but it's, um, you know, sadly, uh, I just saw a thing on the TV last year where they were moving uh, Morgan's statue in Lexington. Uh, it was no longer welcome. Uh, it was a, a huge statue of Morgan on horseback. <coughs> and it was, uh, it was removed uh, to make place for, for political correctness. Um, I think they even had to, uh, I believe he was buried there with his second wife. Um, and I think they had to be removed also. Um, makes you proud of being American, doesn't it? Um, but anyway, um, now one other thing I gotta tell you about, and this is this is why these things never go away. Um, a few years before the 150th anniversary, um, I got a call from somebody with the Ohio Department of Transportation. They said, hey, uh, we know that you're involved in, in the history and so on and so forth. And uh, we're going to be closing the roadside rest where Morgan Surrender Monument is located. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. And, and it, the funny thing about it was that that is not the site of the surrender. The, the surrender site was actually a quarter mile to the east. But when they set up the roadside rests back in the late 50s, they had to set them up where they could lease property. So they leased a, a piece of property from this family. And um, instead of, uh, you know, leasing property where the surrender monument actually was they leased it where they could get it and then moved the monument to the new site. And that's how it was for um, nearly 40 years, I guess. And uh, so the word was they were going to be turning that land back over to the farmers that had leased it to them in the first place. And the restrooms, of course, were going to be demolished and they wanted the monument out of there. So we got into a, a, an unpleasant amount of bickering with various groups 
Uh, it seems that in Columbiana County, if you have a strong opinion about anything, then you're in, on an, an equal basis with everybody else. And there was one lady who unfortunately had been my fifth grade teacher, mm -hmm. Mrs. Possage. Um, she wanted to see that monument move to a little country church, which was not where the surrender took place, but that was the church that she attended. Well, that's swell. Uh, and somebody else wanted to move it to downtown Lisbon. Well, he never got to Lisbon. Well, you know, but I live in Lisbon, and this person said, I think it would be nice there. And uh, I had done a little bit of research. I said, you cannot move that monument anywhere that we don't approve because the East Liverpool Historical Society paid for that monument in 1909. Uh, one of our, our first benefactor, Will Thompson, the, the musician, the composer, donated his own money to mark the site of, of Morgan's surrender. A big uh, uh, glacial boulder and a, a bronze plaque. And uh, we had a big meeting, hilarious meeting actually, um, with representatives of ODOT and the various cranks that <laughs> wanted it move here, there, and everywhere. And uh, it went on for about two hours. And I, I know I finally went to the, uh, they agreed to study it further. And uh, I contacted, I went up to the guy that night. I said, look, I said, this is ridiculous. I said, I'm tempted to just get a wrecker or some kind of a truck pick that damn thing up and move it back to the original site. And the reason I thought I knew we could do that is the Historical Society still owned the little plot of land where, where it sat. And um, this guy looked around, make sure nobody was recording him, make sure nobody saw it. He says, I think that would be your best bet. <laughs> so that's what we did. I've got pictures up here of uh, Morgan's Monument being uh, suspended behind a uh, an industrial sized wrecker and it made the quarter mile trip back to the Krubaugh farm or what was the Krubaugh farm and put back in the same spot where it had been from 1909 to 1958 so and um, uh, the one thing I do I have just a minute to tell something else or sure I've done talks on Morgan's Raid numerous times, and uh, I was asked to, to speak to a group in uh, Boardman who were, they're, they're a heritage group of people who claim to have had Confederate ancestors, and they're very keen on this. And I don't find fault with that, but, but I, I spoke to the group, and they said, well, well can you stick around? We want to we wanna donate money toward this. It's already been moved. They said, well, we want to we want to help beautify the area. <laughs> and and I thought, well, okay, I, any any help is welcome. But uh, uh, as the discussions went on, I realized I was quickly losing control because they were talking about wiring <laughs> and walkways and permanent lighting <laughs> and an 80-foot flagpole. <laughs> And, and eventually I had to ask the question because they were really getting fired up. Um, what, why were you planning on like flying through that 80 foot flagpole? And uh, I got the answer I expected, but you'll, you'll see no flagpole there now. We, we, we have the monument and, and a couple, couple shrubs. Uh, and that's all we need. So it's, uh, it's a happier end to the story than some of the ones in the deeper south. Uh, the other, the other thing that you get when you when you have an interest like this is that you become a clearinghouse. You know, when somebody wants information about something, including people who are, are writing, you know, serious <laughs> histories. Um, somebody gave this guy my name, Lester Horwitz. He was an insurance man from uh, 
the outskirts of Cincinnati. And he told me he was writing the definitive book about Morgan's writing. Well, he, he did write a book. Um, he, he fell prey to every wild story that anybody could tell him, even though he was warned that that particular story is absolute, excuse the expression, BS. <laughs> but they're all in there, and, uh, and he, he was uh, very active uh, with that for a while. And then a couple years after that came out, there was a movement to mark the route of Morgan's raid from the, uh, <clears throat> Indiana had already done so with their portion of the raid route and Ohio followed suit. It took us a while, but uh, we, we marked the, the trail from Harrison, Ohio, all the way to um, the Gabers area. Um, so with uh, markers and uh, maps and, and illustrations and all that. So that was fun. And the guy who, who I was on the committee with, he said, I'm going to write a book about Morgan's raid. And I said, I think you should, because this thing, um, this was his result. And, and I, I got to tell you, this is 10 times the book that this is. Uh, you just can't believe everything that everybody tells you and put it in print. Um, but. I'm still the clearinghouse, so for the next one that comes along, I'll, I'll tell them what I think too, and see what happens. <laughs> Questions about anything? Well, growing up, my dad was enthusiastic about yeah. this. You Mine know? too. You know, and, and I grew up thinking, this was a really big deal. But as far as I can tell, the biggest fame of Morgan's Raid was this was the northernmost incursion. Yes. Of the Confederacy. That's true, because you know uh, that part of Columbiana County is considerably north of Gettysburg. Yeah. Wow. Well. Geographically. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's it's a great story, and I've I've over the the, the years done some things that, that I wouldn't have been able to do when I was a kid. But I found all the original newspapers on microfilm. And, and copied out the contemporary stories and letters that were published at that time. And you, the, the quality of the material is so much better. You, know, you let somebody think about it for 20 years and you know, want to uh, yeah. enhance their own involvement or somebody else's involvement, you don't get good history that way. I guess the other thing that we were all giggling about back here <laughs> is the name Burbank. Yes. Because if you're from around Columbiana itself, <coughs> you know the Burbick family. So we were just wondering. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, they're, they're good people. Oh, they yeah. really are. They are characters. They are yeah. characters. <laughs> this, this guy apparently was, uh, you know, uh, wandering around Lisbon after that. So probably in August or so of 1863. And, it was just like uh, he had won a Grammy or something. You know, he, he, was, he was a big thing for a short period of time. You want to ask Greg if he's related to James? Yes, sir. Just a note, Tim. I mean, you did a lot getting that monument back to where it was. Just a note, you found the actual old fence foundation when you reset that. There, didn't there you? was still a little bit of the wrought iron fence that used to surround the monument when it was first placed. It was still. Actually, it was stuck in the roots of a, a large tree. So we knew roughly where it was. And the night before the uh, wrecker came along to, to uh, help us move it, my dad and I went out there with a couple shovels and thought, well, we ought to at least, you know, see if we can find a good spot for it within this very small area. And as we dug down, a, literally about four inches, we found the concrete pad that the thing had sat on mm -hmm. initially. So we're, we're I, comfortable as fact. Are you talking be. about when Todd Phelps started putting concrete on the floor, for the floor, yeah. and my brother said, come on, what are you doing in there? And I smoke in there. He says, okay, get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a different piece of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> but if there had been concrete, beneath the monument uh, 
in, in 1909. I think they put, put thousands of them around. Oh, they gave us one. <laughs> <laughs> we went to Florida and somebody would go to the restroom, knock on the door, and who's in there? <laughs> who's in there? Going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like the creek at the mill at Beaver Creek State Park. It seems to be from the location of the surrender of Mormon. Yes. Any truth to that? It is. Uh, there was a tree right across the road from the, the site of the surrender. Uh, I think it was an elm. And over the years, it, it died and it was still standing there. And about the time that they were putting up the, the original monument, um, they cut down what was left of that tree and took it to East Liverpool, uh, where it was, was placed in the Carnegie Library up on the second floor, which used to be the, uh, the museum, Bef long before the Museum of Ceramic. That was the museum for anything historical in East Liverpool. And that was up there for forever. And, and I know that the director of the library used to tell me, he said, you know, Tim, you gotta get that tree trunk out of here. I said, how? You know, there, were no, uh, there was no elevator at that time. They had basically carried it up there when the building was, was being constructed. And uh, then they got a different director and, and apparently I didn't uh, show sufficient interest in moving this tree trunk. And I got a call one day that it was out on the sidewalk. They had, uh, put in an elevator shaft and they lowered the tree. You know, it was a huge thing. I mean, it has to weigh probably 1,500 pounds to 2,000 pounds. And uh, they put it out on the sidewalk. I said, well, I don't want it. And I tried to talk uh, the Lisbon Historical Society into taking it. They didn't want it. And then the East Liverpool mayor grabbed it and put it in a, uh, a, the, the old car barn. And it was up there for years. And eventually, uh, we talked to the people at the mill, and they, they wanted it. So the first time I saw it out there, I, I absolutely cringed. This thing was festooned with more Confederate flags and banners, and, and it was a shrine to the Confederacy. And I thought, this is before everybody lost their minds several years ago. <laughs> but even then, it's like, oh, no, you, you just don't do this. I mean, what, you have to live in Mississippi. Um, but it's toned down now. It's still there. They, they've toned down the uh, yeah. thing. So, but it's, it's fun to see what people do with their history. <laughs> so. Okay, I hope I haven't uh, bored you too much.